everybody for coming to the second webinar of the Isle of Wight Natural History and Archaeological Society's 100th celebration. Uh, the Society has been running since 1919. It was started with 100 members and now it has 14 very active groups uh, ranging from archaeology to visual photography and a whole range of bat and flora and fauna groups and such like in between. Um, today's webinar is something that's very close to my heart, which is invasive species um, and horizon scanning. And we've got three absolutely brilliant uh, speakers who I will introduce in a minute. Um, but firstly, I'm going to talk about I Watch Wildlife. And I don't know whether everyone's aware of I Watch Wildlife, but it's a brilliant project of the Natural History Society. And it's all about getting people to engage in citizen science and record what they see. It's been running for about five years now. And last year it had the most ever recordings of hedgehogs and stag beetles, which um, are species that are great causes to concern um, across the country. And so it's very useful to get a healthy recording um, of them to see what's happening. Um, it's mainly on social media, although you can uh, participate through the Society website. And coming up very soon is, um, well, in fact, tomorrow, they're starting to record adders for the next month. And then that will move on to Glanville fritillary butterflies in May and stag beetles in June. There's also two species of the year, which are stoats and weasels. So they're very interested to get recordings of those. Three speakers this evening are all going to introduce themselves, so it's just left for me to welcome them. And I'm absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Helen Roy. Um, I've listened to Helen many times talk, actually, um, because uh, if you work in the world of invasive species, um, you're bound to come across Helen, uh, whether it's about her ladybird projects. Um, she also turns up at the annual Invasive Species Conference that I go to, and I know she's invited there for the clarity of which she talks. So I think you're in for a treat this evening. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you all. I'm just going to um, share my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. Can you see a title page? Is it all good? Great, thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be with you. And I'm going to talk about some of the work um, that I and many, many, many others um, have been doing to make some predictions about what might be the next invasive non-native species to pose a threat in various places around the world. But before I begin, I wanted to say congratulations to the Isle of Wight um, Natural History Society. It's really fantastic to be part of your celebrations and um, particularly because I was at school on the Isle of Wight and um, was involved with some of the um, natural history events that were going on while I was a teenager. I was an active member of a local bat group and out small mammal trapping and um, it really I was so delighted to be invited to be with you um, this evening. So thank you very much for um, inviting me here and for all of you um, being here. And I'm very pleased to join your celebrations. So I just thought I'd share a few pictures of the Isle of Wight. And this is looking out um, to Newtown. Not that you need to see pictures of the Isle of Wight because you're over there, probably most of you. But um, I'm not. I'm in South Oxfordshire at the moment. And I do miss visiting the Isle of Wight very much. Um, but this is Newtown. And I don't know how many of you um, were part of Cows High School and the trips that used to go out to Newtown with Mr. Cox. But I was really lucky to be one of those um, school students who was able to do that. And it really did um, hugely spark my interest interest in um, natural history and um, really was an absolute privilege to be part of that. And also more recently, I've been back to the Isle of Wight to do some work on Bonchurch Down. And um, this is myself and some of my friends and colleagues scouring, looking for the little larvae of the Adonis blue butterfly. Um, and again, just a lot of um, fond memories of being out there. And with the Chalk Hill blues flying there as well, it's a really unusual sight to have both Adonis and Chalk Hill um, within one site. 
And I thought I'd show you a picture because I am missing the Isle of Wight. And over the whole period of lockdown, of course, I've been over once. My um, dad and my stepmother and my sister are still on the Isle of Wight. And um, it's just such a wonderful place to come and visit. And I am missing it very much. But my dad, this is one of his paintings, and he's here this evening. Um, this is Freshwater Bay. And so I've been kept in contact with the Isle of Wight in many different ways. And certainly my dad's paintings bring me a lot of joy. But I'm looking forward to coming back to the Isle of Wight because I recently heard a talk and heard about this wonderful moth, the reddish buff. And I'm really looking forward to coming to see if I can um, find this particular moth. It was very exciting. I hadn't heard of that before and I was very excited to hear about that very recently. So lots of exciting finds um, for me to look forward to um, as we ease out of lockdown. So to the subject of this talk, I'm going to be talking about invasive non-native species and particularly about making predictions about invasive non-native species, but I thought I'd give a very broad context um, to begin with. And um, back in 2019, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services published their global assessment on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And in many ways, there's many stark and quite depressing messages that came out of this report biodiversity is declining faster than at any other time in human history and we're looking towards one million species being at risk of extinction. It's a really quite um, a bleak picture. So what's causing all of this biodiversity change? Well, we have quite a good understanding really in terms of things such as climate change, land and sea use change, exploitation of species, um, pollution events, but invasive non-native species are up there amongst those big challenging factors that are causing biodiversity change. And if we just look to um, the United Kingdom, for instance, um, and published in the State of Nature report, which is an inspiring collaboration amongst many different um, partners, but led by the RSPB, um, we can see that within the UK, we have about 2000 established non-native species. So these are species that are reproducing within the UK. And we're getting new species year on year. It's important to remember that many of these non-native species are not causing any problems to us at all, but there are some that are causing lots of problems and um, they're the ones that we're really focusing on here. And if we take a look around the world, and this um, figure here is a collation of data sets from all around the world, including Britain, but all the way across um, Europe and um, Africa, America, Australia, all of the data of first records has been compiled. And um, from this graph, you can see it's just going up and up and up over time with time on that um, x-axis. And what we're seeing is the number of non-native species arriving in new places around the world is increasing year on year. And there's no sign of that slowing. It's just going up and up and up. I think it is really important to make sure that we have a very clear definition of non-native species and of invasive non-native species. And I have quite a passion for ladybirds. I run the UK Ladybird Survey, so I'd love to have your records for ladybirds um, as they're appearing through the spring just at the moment. Um, but I think they provide a really excellent way to demonstrate um, the definitions of non-native and invasive non-native species. So this ladybird here is the bryony ladybird. As its name suggests, it feeds on white bryony. That's all it feeds on. And um, on the distribution map that you can see there, you can just see a cluster of dots. It first arrived in Surrey back in the mid 1990s. And you can see that it hasn't gone very far at all. Um, I went for a special trip to go and see it um, and had to go to a car park in Guildford um, to scour the white bryony around that car park. It's very um, locally distributed, a beautiful ladybird, and that's this little larva that you can see there in the picture as well. So a non-native species is one that's been moved from one part of the world to another part of the world by humans, and that human part is really important within this definition. So a subset of these non-native species or alien species will cause some kind of problem. And the harlequin ladybird here is a very good example of a species that causes problems. And the animation you can see there is um, the spread of the harlequin ladybird um, through Britain after it was first recorded in 2004. We wouldn't have this data set if it wasn't for amazing people like yourselves who send in their records of harlequin ladybirds and have allowed us to track the spread. 
But what's quite alarming is we were able to show that this tiny ladybird that's about six millimeters long spread at about 100 kilometers per year. I think that's absolutely staggering. And we, we haven't properly assessed it, but we think it's probably one of the fastest spreading invasive alien or non-native species that there is. So we use the term invasive when we're thinking about the species that do pose a threat to biodiversity or to ecosystems or indeed the way we live. And the harlequin ladybird is a good example of that. It was introduced by humans, so that's an important part of that definition, as a biological control agent. It's a very, very good aphid predator, um, but it also feeds on lots of other things as well, other ladybirds, lacewings, other um, beneficial insects. Um, and it will also feed on soft fruit and can be a little bit of a human nuisance as well by forming very large aggregations in buildings. So we would think of the harlequin ladybird as being an invasive non-native species. So very excitingly in the news today, invasive species are appearing and um, excitingly and sort of depressingly, but there's some good news as well. So this was in the Guardian just at four o'clock this afternoon that um, damage from invasive species worldwide is trebling every decade. But the good news with this is that the damage that they're causing and the cost of that damage is trebling every decade, but the management costs are a lot, lot lower. And there are things that we can do about these species. And in particular, what we can do is prevent their arrival in the first place, so prevent the damaging ones arriving in the first place. And I thought I'd make this talk focused on islands that seemed very appropriate while celebrating um, 100 years of the Isle of Wight Natural History Society to really focus on islands. And I have a particular fondness of islands, perhaps because I spent a lot of my childhood um, on the Isle of Wight. I'm sure that played a big part in it. But we know that biological invasions on islands are really, really problematic. So when we think about invasion, of non-native species within against the backdrop of all of the other things that are causing environmental change. Um, we think of them as being one of the sort of top five reasons that we're seeing bi biodiversity change. On islands, they're the top reason. They're really, really problematic. We know that islands occupy a very small part of the Earth's land area. Yeah, we know that they're home to about 15% of terrestrial species. And we also know that they have a very high extinction rate on islands and invasive non-native species or invasive alien species are implicated in most of those extinctions. And we also know there's some very, very special species on islands. And I mean, of course, we know that from the Isle of Wight with some of the species that I've already um, mentioned with the, the beautiful butterflies but also for example the red squirrel and I have to say well we were just having our practice before um, meeting with you all this evening I was being watched by a grey squirrel out in the garden and it shows how long I've been away from the Isle of Wight the grey squirrels have just become part of what I see around but when I am on the Isle of Wight and I have the wonderful experience of seeing a red squirrel um, it fills me with a lot of joy and excitement so we know that islands are, are very special places um, for wildlife of all kinds. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some work that we've been doing, working with island communities all around the world to make some predictions um, through what's called horizon scanning. So we know that if we can make these predictions and we can make good predictions, then we can put in measures to stop the arrival of those species that we predict are going to be really damaging into the future. And that's the most cost effective way to manage biological invasions. And so we've developed this method where we can gather all the best available information that we can from databases, from the literature, um, from all kinds of sources for a whole variety of species spanning plants and animals, aquatic and also terrestrial environments. And we can bring all of this information together. But what we then see is we've got lots of gaps that get in our way with making the predictions, lots of things we don't know. But what we can then do is bring along experts and work with experts, empower those experts to fill in some of those gaps using the knowledge that they have on all of those other species. So this very complicated slide is a way of showing that sort of process where we gather that information and then bring the experts together. And it's a really exciting process to be involved with because not only do I get to meet amazing experts and talk about lots and lots of different species, um, but also it's the way that we can fill in some of those knowledge gaps. And we've worked out lots of different ways to ensure that we can make this process as robust as possible so that we really can make good predictions on which to then base um, action going forward. 
And we look at a whole variety of impacts. We look at biodiversity and ecosystem impacts, and we use a special classification system that we've developed to be able to categorize those impacts. And um, what we can see here is two of um, my colleagues and collaborators, and um, they're on St Helena here with some New Zealand flax. And New Zealand flax was introduced onto St Helena um, for the rope industry, but it's really invaded the cloud forests on this amazing island. And I'm going to come back to that um, in a moment. But it's having really profound biodiversity and ecosystem impacts um, by completely altering the system in which it has arrived and spread. We also look at socioeconomic impacts and again we've developed a classification system to be able to to do this and again um, here is um, one of my collaborators Olaf Boy um, stood um, by some hogweed and we know that this hogweed can um, really be quite a human health problem in terms of um, causing sores when um, people come into contact um, with it. We can look very broadly at human health impacts and of course this is really really relevant to us at the moment um, living through this current pandemic and um, you may have followed the news in the way in which um, the um, COVID-19 virus has been um, cycling between mink and farm workers on those mink farms and um, we know that um, there are other invasive non-native species that could also be um, involved in the transmission of um, zoonoses such as the one um, that we're experiencing at the moment. Of course many of the invasive non-native species have multiple impacts. They may have human health impacts but they might also have economic impacts. They might um, prevent people being able to navigate waterways for instance or in the case of some species such as zebra mussels they can block um, pipes, water pipes for instance. Um, many of them have biodiversity and ecosystem impacts as well as those economic impacts and some have human health impacts um, as well. So what we do is we bring together all of this information on the impacts, but we also think about how the species are moving around the world, how could they get to different places and what's their chances of establishing if they arrive in a new place. And so I was really fortunate to receive some funding by the UK government um, through the Common Foreign and Commonwealth Office um, to be able to carry out a study on the UK overseas territories. And this map shows um, where they all are. I'm shamelessly, I didn't know where they were, all were before I started the study. And and um, throughout the study, I've become more and more passionate about these places and, and putting in for further funding to do more work um, on them because they're really unique places and the people who are living there and um, conserving the wildlife are absolutely amazing as well. So we basically did this predictive exercise for all of these 16 UK overseas territories. It was a lot of work, but it was a huge amount of fun. And I thought it would be nice just to talk through a few of those islands and show you a few pictures of those islands and talk a bit, little bit about the problems they're experiencing and then come to um, tell you about the problems that they may well experience going into the future um, if we don't do some things about it. So the first um, territories that we went to were the Caribbean islands and um, this is Grand Cayman and um, we brought together people from across all of the six UK overseas territories that are situated within um, the Caribbean and this was our first horizon scanning exercise with the um, UK overseas territories and it was just an absolutely amazing experience to spend a week with people who know these islands so well and they know their unique flora and fauna and between us we were able to work together um, to produce these ranked lists of species that could pose a threat. I don't know how well you can see underneath this car is a green iguana. And when we first arrived um, in Grand Cayman, and it was so exciting to see the green iguanas. And then you suddenly realize as you come out of the airport car park, you see green iguanas literally everywhere. So when we were there in 2018, there are about a million individual green iguanas. This is an introduced species onto Grand Cayman. The populations um, can double every year and they are currently going through an eradication um, program at the moment, but it's tremendously hard work. I mean, you, can you imagine on a small island, several million green iguanas? They're literally everywhere and they're causing problems in a whole variety of different ways. They're causing problems with um, causing electricity to short out by getting into electricity boxes. Um, 
but perhaps most worrying is the effects they're having on um, biodiversity. And on Grand Cayman, they have an endemic blue iguana, and um, they've had a really successful captive breeding program for the um, blue iguana and reintroduction into the wild. And now really sadly, this green iguana is posing a threat to those blue iguanas, both through disease transmission, but also competing with the habitats that the blue iguana um, likes to live in. But you can also see along the beaches here, this is a um, invasive non-native seaweed that um, the people to keep the tourism going are having to clear every day, just going along and trying to clear all of the seaweed. And, and it's a really, really beautiful island. Um, but you can imagine there's not a lot of space to be putting things like the seaweed and indeed very macabrely all of the dead iguanas. So this is um, Turks and Caicos Islands, um, also in the Caribbean. They also have an endemic um, iguana and they also have the green iguana just arriving. So when we were there, there were three individuals who had just been reported and they were bringing in a task force um, to try and um, eliminate the population um, immediately to provide protection to their endemic iguana and indeed the other wildlife that um, the green iguana could be feeding on. And this is um, St. Helena in the mid Atlantic Ocean. And um, what you can see there in the foreground is that New Zealand flax that I mentioned, a really, really spiky, tough plant. And it's literally covering the top of St. Helena. And as you look across the valleys, um, it's really invaded the cloud forest. Um, really dramatically. St Helena is home to more than 400 endemic invertebrates. So they are invertebrates that don't occur anywhere else in the world. That's, it's just incredible. I mean, to be able to go and visit these places has just been such an immense privilege. And I really feel a sense of um, responsibility that we should really be supporting the communities in these places to be able to maintain and conserve this wonderful and unique wildlife that they have. And they've had some real success in clear clearing um, some of the New Zealand flax and reintroducing um, some of the native plants. It's really amazing what um, the people here are doing in um, quite basic facilities for being able to carry out these quite ambitious restoration projects. I don't know how well you can see this. Can you see um, a little yellow spiky creature? Um, I put the big arrow to point to it because you could easily miss it. But we were so excited to see this because this is an endemic spiky woodlouse um, that occurs on St Helena. We walked a long way to see this little woodlouse and um, I was really very, very excited um, that we managed to see it on the underside of um, this fern. There's a, a big program going on at the moment to ensure that this little woodlouse is there for other people to see going forward into the future. So then another of the territories we visited was within the British Indian Ocean and um, Diego Garcia. And um, this is largely populated by um, a military base, as you're probably all aware of um, from within the military. Um, it's not without contention at all, um, this island and um, the holding of it. Um, but what is without contention is just how beautiful it is and it has the largest contiguous natural reef of anywhere in the world so its marine habitats are just second to none. Um, we couldn't go in the marine habitats because there were sharks all around but um, there was a small patch that we were able to go in and swim but I must admit I had a bit of an adrenaline rush every time I went in um, but we certainly couldn't swim off this shore it was a lot of sharks. But it's also home to a lot of crabs and a lot of other amazing um, seashore animals. And um, I hadn't heard of crab markets before I went to um, Diego Garcia. And we'd taken, as we do to these places, some amazing experts from around the world. And our crustacean expert um, demonstrated this crab market to us. And I, I just think it's amazing that the crabs, they come along, these little hermit crabs, and they find a shell that's empty a big shell and then the, the crabs who are the big crabs will try and get into that big shell and what you can see at the um, far side of this slide are the two very large crabs fighting over a shell and all of the others are lined up because they know a shell is going to become free any moment and they can just hop into the next sized um, shell along the way. It, I'd never heard of this and to be able to stand there and watch these crabs doing this it was over in a second it went on and on the wrestling went on and on for ages but once the crab 
the winning crab had got its new shell, all the others were instantaneously flicking into their next size shell. Um, really beautiful to watch. This is another crab on the British Indian Ocean territory of Diego Garcia. This is a coconut crab, um, a massive, massive animal. And um, this crab, if, for example, some of the ants that we have been predicting could arrive in this territory arrived, could be really a threat um, from the um, ant species. It's hard to imagine some tiny ants um, really managing to pose a threat to this heavily armored coconut crab. Um, but indeed, they would do exactly that by all working together. So this is um, the Cyprus Overseas Territories, and I've done a lot of work there and worked with my fantastic colleague, um, Kelly Martineau, um, and others as well. And this is the Akrotiri wetland. And I never think my photos do justice to this wetland, um, but it is a really unique place and um, under um, huge protection possibly of a lot of the territories that we visit, this one is under huge threat from people. You can see in the distance, um, the huge urban conurbation and that's just impinging and growing all the way around um, to this wetland. They're currently um, building um, a casino right on top of this wetland. And so all, all that we can possibly do to um, try and keep out some of the problematic species that might come along with that um, human movement into this area um, has to, to be a good thing. So we've recently published the um, list for horizon scanning um, with Darwin funding. So with all of these 16 overseas territories and thinking particularly about the island territories, we were able to look at the commonalities amongst them. What are the species that are kind of the global island invaders, if you like? And um, right at the top of our list is a marine animal, the Asian green mussel. And um, this is a species that can easily hitchhike lifts around with um, ships and yachts. And um, it is a really extreme filter feeder. So in when it forms um, a cluster of green mussels, they can um, process the water and really alter the chemistry of the water around them, but also the community of other things that are living within that water. So they will take out a lot of the um, algal components and the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, and this will have a cascading effect on other species further up the, the, the food chain. So these green mussels are really problematic. Sometimes I get asked, which are the species that cause you most concern? And I think it's the species that in a way most fascinate me, but they do also most cause me most concern and they are the ants. Ants are just amazing at um, colonizing in new areas. And um, one of the species that we're very worried about at the moment is the little fire ant, Wasmania or punctata. And um, we believe it's a species that could settle in many places around the world. And then it would cause all kinds of problems if it gets into some of the seabird colonies that um, many of these islands have that are very unique. It can cause all kinds of problems in terms of getting in amongst the feathers and interfering generally with um, the behaviour of the seabirds. Um, but in some cases in Hawaii, for instance, where they now have Wasmania or Punctata, um, farm workers are having to clear the sites. They can't work there because, as its name suggests, it's, um, it's a little fire ant. Um, it can cause really, really painful um, stings. There's a whole variety um, of species that we're seeing and some are not surprising such as the rats and the mosquitoes, um, lionfish we're seeing throughout the Caribbean now and also uh, around Cyprus already. So in a way, you can think it seems a little bit gloomy. All these species are on the move and all of these species could be posing a threat to these unique and amazing places around the world. But there is a lot that we can do. And actually we were stranded on um, St. Helena for an extra week because um, the clouds came down and the runway for the aeroplane is in the cloud forest. And um, so the aeroplane couldn't get back to collect us. Um, Actually, we, we were quite delighted because it meant we could have more time exploring St. Helena. But one of the things we also did was because over that period of time when you're working with um, these amazing people, um, 
you develop friendships, of course, as well. And so we said, you know, is there anything useful? We're now, you're now stuck with us and we're very delighted to be stuck here. And um, so the biosecurity team said, why didn't you come and help us? Because we have got a container that's come in and you can help us sort through all the fruit and vegetables. I have to say it was a really enjoyable afternoon, but I'm not entirely sure how helpful we were. I kept asking, are we really being helpful? And they said, no, no, you definitely are. But um, well, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but it was a really enjoyable afternoon and to see biosecurity in action. But we're also able to share these lists with other people and we've published the list for the Antarctic Peninsula and that's now being used through the um, Secretariat of the Antarctic Treaty for all of the Antarctic regions um, to be able to think about their biosecurity measures which are already excellent but can be more targeted by knowing about these lists. We've also done work um, across Europe and I've led projects for the European Commission to make these same predictions for the whole of um, the EU. And we now have a regulation for invasive alien species across the whole of the EU. And I'm pleased to know it's continuing to be adopted within Britain as well. Um, and we have been working with these horizon scanning lists to help create the list of invasive alien species of EU concern. So to inform um, that process has been very exciting. And there's many ways in which you can also get involved. So one of the species that we're seeing that we're concerned about um, across the UK is the Asian hornet. And um, we predicted in an early horizon scanning back in 2012 that this is a species that could potentially arrive. And so we set up the Asian hornet watch and an alert system and we did lots of publicity to promote um, the system for recording Asian hornets. And year on year, you can see on this line graph, we see more and more reports coming in um, over time of, of what people think have been Asian hornets. I'm very pleased to say we've only had about two reports every year. So we're getting thousands of reports. Only a few of them are Asian hornets. But if we didn't get those thousands of reports, we wouldn't be able to find those Asian hornets. And as a consequence of being able to find them, the, the nests have been eradicated year on year. And so far, Asian hornets are not within um, the United Kingdom, but it's definitely one for you all to be looking out for um, on, on the Isle of Wight. Looks a little bit like the European hornet, but these really bright yellow legs are very characteristic. And we've been looking at, so we made the predictions about the Asian hornet arriving. We've been partly involved in um, implementing um, the action for it through our alert systems, although I have to say it's been collab other collaborators who've actually done the hard work of going out and managing um, these populations. But we were asked, so what if we hadn't done any of that? What if we hadn't done that horizon scanning? We hadn't done any of the eradications. Would it, would it be everywhere or would it have not been anywhere? So we carried out some modeling and I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but environmental suitability modeling, and we coupled that with a spread model, taking into account sort of biological features of these species to look at how they could spread and we've seen that we would have had really dramatic spread by 2026 um, and you can see on that map with those sort of pink and red areas of where the Asian hornet would have been had those eradications of those nests um, not taken place so it's really um, been fantastic work. I just thought I'd finish by mentioning um, a really exciting project that's going on at the moment and that's again with the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity System services I mentioned um, right at the very beginning and at the moment we're in the middle of a thematic global assessment on invasive alien species and I have the pleasure of being one of the co-chairs of that assessment and working with about 80 experts from all around the world and it's really inspiring and we have a lot of cause for optimism in terms of the solutions that we're finding that are coming through that report that we can apply globally to address the threat of invasive non-native species. And you on the Isle of Wight have an invasive alien species management plan and I was taking a look at it and it's really fantastic so I really strongly urge you to take a look at it and see what part you could play on the Isle of Wight with respect to um, managing invasive alien species. And I've put it's a long web address but you can just google your Isle of Wight ma management plan and you'll find it. So I hope I've demonstrated to you these inspiring places around the world, just like the Isle of Wight, but further afield, and the inspiring people that I've met along the way and had the great privilege to work with, including on the Isle of Wight as well. And um, I've just been so fortunate to have these opportunities and so grateful to all of the people um, who I've been working with over the years to do this work. And thank you all very much as well for listening. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you and I'm looking forward to your questions, but I'm really looking forward to the next two talks first. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Helen. That's absolutely fascinating. Our next speaker has said, just say I'm Keith from the Society. Um, and I'm really pleased to welcome Keith Marston, not just from the um, Natural History Society, but um, also from Medina Valley Centre in a past life. Um, Keith is my go-to man for an idiot check. If ever I want to publish anything about birds or flora or fauna, uh, Keith very kindly checks uh, my facts for me and sends me photos. Um, so I'm very interested to hear what you say about Canada geese, Keith. I've always, um, when I wear my invasive species hat, I don't like them, but I always get a thrill when I see them, when I come across them on the island. So I'm very keen to hear what your take is and whether we should love them or hate them. Thank you, Keith. Well, thank you uh, very much, Carol. And um, after that completely fascinating global tour, of the world's islands. I think uh, we can now sort of turn our focus to our island and um, have a look at the uh, bird uh, fauna in particular. Now all the species you see listed there um, under breeding range expansion, um, these have all reached Great Britain from mainland Europe and um, their breeding range has extended across the English Channel um, at, and it's almost certainly in a response to the changing climate. And I think especially the milder winters that we've been having is enabling the birds to stay with us. And, and all those species there, from the Dartford warbler to the little bittern, just a few decades ago, they were all counted as rarities, turning up occasionally. Um, but they're all now on the British list as resident breeders. Um, We've seen, they've all been seen on the island and uh, the first five on the list, the Dartford Warbler, Chetty's Warbler, Firecrest, Little Egret and Great White Egret, um, they, they're, they're, they're all welcome residents now and apparently posing, you know, without posing a threat to other species. So the Little Egret, which is the bird behind the larger white bird in the photo, uh, as many of you know, it's now commonplace along our estuaries and water courses. And there's up to six white, um, great white egrets now resident on the island. And this bird turned up in the Benina Valley, which is, as Carol says, been my patch for over 30 years. For the first time, turned up on Christmas Day last year. Um, then we've got the Chetis warbler breed in the island reed beds and in, in our local reed beds in the Medina Valley now. Uh, possibly two pairs there. And of course, the Dartford Warbler in uh, our patches of heathland as well. Meanwhile, those other birds in the bottom right there, the, the Dotterel, the Wimbrel, the Common Scoter, the Slavonian Grebe, well, um, there's, there's other pressures, um, almost certainly due to and linked to climate change. Um, uh, further north in Britain, these species are at risk of extinct, extinction as breeding species. And um, we see them all here on passage uh, on an average year. Uh, some of them more common than others as they pass through. And as we know, also the warming oceans are playing a part in reducing the availability of prey items for seabirds. So these, we've heard a lot about uh, non-native species and um, all of these species in this list from the common pheasant to the Canada goose, uh, they've all been introduced into the UK. Um, some of them have escaped from collections, but they have naturalized and, uh, and again, they appear on the British list. So, all of these have been seen on the island and these three black swans, of course, native to New Zealand, um, were seen in Newport Harbour in 2019. Now, three of the species on that uh, list there um, are categorised as invasive in Great Britain. Um, in other words, there's a potential threat to, to native wildlife, uh, as Helen was adhering to and um, the ring-necked parakeet, so the ruddy duck and the ring-necked parakeet, and the Canada goose. Um, the first two have paid visits to the island, and of course the Canada goose is a, a, 
is of course resident here with us. So what we're going to do, well, just to say also that the, the Egyptian goose and the common pheasant um, is in the list of uh, 100 uh, uh, targeted invasive species in Europe, uh, as well as the others. So let's have a closer look at our Canada goose. So the, the Canada goose um, first arrived in Great Britain in 1665, um, when a pair were, was added to King Charles II's waterfowl collection in St. James's Park, central London. Um, and it wasn't really until the 1950s um, when the population began to really grow and, and, and increase. And, and that was following deliberate translocation of the birds. Um, first of all, to reduce local pressures on agricultural land, because they were, a, even then, was, were a menace to the agricultural land. And then the translocation in the 1960s and 70s of hundreds of birds throughout southern England to provide sport for shooting. So the, the first coordinated surveys of wetland bird species really started across Great Britain in the mid 1970s. Um, this was then known as the Birds of Estuary Inquiry. Um, and then there was the wildlife and estuary counts um, and they were brought together um, in 1993 uh, as the Wetland Bird Survey. So using this standardized uh, data, it's not a complete set of data of all the Canada goose in Britain, but using this Wetland Bird Survey standardized data, um, there are a little over 10,000 Canada geese in Great Britain in 1976. And their numbers rose rapidly in the, in the mid 1990s, um, rising here in, and it's the latest data that I've been able to, to find, uh, to 75,000 birds by the 2017-18 winter there. But there's a, an estimated total population of Canada de geese in Great Britain of over 190,000 birds. Now, there was a comprehensive bird survey across Great Britain um, in 2007, between 2007 and 2011, and all that data was put together and published in a bird atlas, um, for which my computer is propped up on at the moment because it's an ideal size. Um, so from these two maps, um, uh, we'll, which is an extract from that bird atlas, um, you can see that there's a, a clear expansion in the, in the breeding range um, of the bird. And there was a, uh, in 1968 to 1972, there was the, uh, you know, a previous survey, which ended up in another atlas. And comparing the two sets of data, uh, the Canada geese clearly expanded that breeding range into the West Country, uh, into Wales, um, if we look at that one where the red dots are, Wales, uh, Northern England, right into Scotland, into Northern Ireland as well, between those dates, 1968 um, and 2011. And incidentally, uh, there's been uh, uh, a similar huge increase in the breeding range into mainland Europe, into France and the Netherlands. In fact, between those two dates, um, the breeding range extension was increased by 162% in that uh, short time. So if we look at the island now, um, the, this pattern of exponential growth in Great Britain is, is really mirrored here on the island. Um, so since the first six birds were recorded, on the 3rd of August, 1959, off Gurnard. And the first breeding uh, was uh, recorded at Newtown in 1971. Numbers have, as you can see on this graph, dramatically increased, uh, particularly since the, the mid-1990s. 
what we're using here is the annual maxima of birds at a single site, um, which just gives us an indicator. And uh, in 2019, for the first time, um, uh, a thousand, over a thousand birds were recorded in a single site. And of course, that was at the RSPB reserve at the Braiding Marshes. Um, it, it, uh, 1,330 birds were counted uh, then. Uh, 2020, we, again, we had a count of over a thousand birds, but didn't quite get as high as the 90, 2019 total. So there's the question that we're posing. Um, is the Canada goose a welcome addition to biodiversity on the Isle of Wight? It's one of um, 20 invasive non-native species listed in the, uh, the 2019 State of Nature in the UK report. Um, and it has demonstrated major environmental impact. So geese will overgraze agricultural land, um, young crops, cereals, potatoes, rape. They'll compact the soil. Um, they'll reduce water quality with their droppings. They'll hybridize with other goose species. And of course, they can be a threat to aviation. But actually, little research has, has, has been attempted to quantify this uh, in ecological impact. Uh, not, not only on the island, but um, across Great Britain as well. So, so is the Canada goose really causing a major environmental impact here on the Isle of Wight? Well, the answer really is we don't know because it's a mobile species and it's undoubtedly under-recorded in areas from sites that are closely watched and recorded by bird watchers. And the highest annual maxima comes from sites where there's systematic co coverage by that wetland bird survey every month. And we don't know what the total population of the Canada goose uh, is on the island or, or even the places where you know, they feed across the island because of that shortage of coverage. However, Canada geese are contributing positively to the management of the, our only RSPB reserve at Braiding Marshes. They're contributing positively. Now, you see cattle have been introduced to the marshes specifically to graze the area to create a sward that encourages breeding red shank and lapwing. Um, that's where they like to nest. And it, it's in these grazed areas that um, the, the overwintering widgeon are attracted to. So they need a cropped sward. Now, it's estimated that um, the, if it was a flock of a thousand geese, which is what we're getting regularly now on the RSPB reserve, they will graze the equivalent to 16 or 17 cattle on the marsh. So in other words, 61 geese graze the equivalent of one of those cows. And they're all free and they all come in. But we know that there's exponential growth in the numbers of this invasive non-native species here on the island. And, um, you know, when, when it, will it begin to have a real detrimental effect on the environment here? Well, as we've said, there's gaps in the data. So thorough counts only tend to be made at those sites of the wetland bird surveys, um, which in turn are the places where most effort is made by bird watchers. So um, this is where we can all play a part. More data is needed. So remember, anyone can get involved in recording numbers, counting numbers of birds and the location where you see them. Uh, where they're feeding, perhaps what crop they're feeding on or where they're feeding. We can look out for breeding success and nests and young birds, goslings and where they are. And we can all enter records simply online on an online database such as Bird Track or Go Birding or iRecord. Um, I suppose for those who um, aren't experienced bird watchers, maybe just need to check a good bird guide to distinguish 
between the Canada goose and the dark bellied Brent goose, um, which they sort of come together in the winter months. But um, it won't take uh, a, a few moments to, to, to know which is which. Oh, and I suppose incidentally, I'll just uh, make a little plug here. Uh, there are great benefits um, to long-term data sets. I know Robin is, is with us this evening, who's the, uh, the bird recorder for the island. I think he would say the same, that there's long, great benefits to long-term data set if more people could su submit complete lists um, of all bird species seen on a visit to a site uh, into those databases. Now, the adult Canada goose has no natural predators, uh, or does it? Uh, this carcass of a Canada goose was taken um, on the braiding marshes in 2019, and it coincided when they took the photograph with a visit to the reserve of one of the reintroduced native white-tailed eagles. And uh, you can see uh, a photo of that just at the bottom left there. And that is at braiding. It's on, on top of a tree at, in the braiding marshes. Now, the eagles, of course, will scavenge on dead birds, but um, th 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 there's, there's actually been no evidence of predation on the Canada geese flocks until last Thursday. Now, two white-tailed eagles have been present on the braiding marshes almost daily since, since February, since mid-February, and they've been observed swooping on the Canada geese on the water, on the yar. Now, look closely at this next series of photographs because these were taken last Thursday at the RSPB reserve over the River Yar by John Carter. And you've got not only one, but two, both the juvenile white-tailed eagles working together. And uh, here you can just make out the target um, Canada goose, which has submerged itself. And it's still submerged many seconds on, knowing that it's still uh, being attacked. And then here is a white-tailed eagle on a, an adult Canada goose on top of it there in the water. And here you've got the second uh, white-tailed eagle um, just nearby. And just in attendance there, you've got a marsh harrier as well. So maybe this reintroduction of the native sea eagle. Um, of course, it was last seen historically on Culver Down in 1799. Maybe it could assist in keeping the invasive non-native Canada goose population in check. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Absolutely fascinating. We've got our final speak speaker, which is Dr. Roger Herbert. Um, Roger is a doctor in barnacles, he's told me this evening. Um, he is also another uh, past uh, person from Medina Valley Centre. And uh, while he was there, he had the honour of being my Open University tutor. And Roger uh, inspired me in the same way as Lou Cox inspired uh, Helen. So I, I have a lot to thank him for. Um, so Roger is going to talk about marine invasions. Um, and over to you, Roger. Good evening, everybody, and um, what a fantastic couple of talks uh, we've had so far. And um, well, happy anniversary, if that's the right word, for the Isle of Wight Natural History Society. Uh, happy centenary. Um, I've been on the island 40 years, and I'm indebted to the society for what I have learned from many members over the years. Um, and um, long may be that be the case. Uh, I love living on the island. Uh, love the wildlife, love the people, and most importantly, we're surrounded by water. And I love water, as people will know. I enjoy sailing, kayaking, and uh, occasionally being dunked in the water. 
And uh, of course, um, my interest in water extends to the wildlife of the water as well. And um, marine life is, is something which I've been interested in for a very, very long time. Um, partly inspired by, I think, another um, guest this evening, uh, Dr. Bill Farnham of um, Portsmouth University, uh, who uh, was one of my excellent tutors. Uh, so this evening we're going to be thinking about um, marine life and indeed non-native marine life. And a big question really is, well, it's all perhaps um, too easy to contain species and eradicate uh, invasive nuisance species on land, but what about when it gets into the sea? How can we possibly manage marine life in sea? Now, I don't want to shock people here because some of these species we don't have on the island. So that's the, the, uh, uh, the first thing I must say, um, but perhaps I should say yet. But you've heard about the, the big African five that uh, you would hope to see when going out on safari. Well, here are some big three invasive marine fauna. Uh, for example, the lionfish, which Helen has mentioned already. Uh, native to the um, Indo-Pacific region, it's now a real nuisance in the Caribbean, uh, the east coast of North America and the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, a lot smaller is the uh, sea walnut, or it's a type of sea gooseberry, native to North and South America. It's now got into the Black Sea and is in the Mediterranean. Very voracious predator, of course, um, uh, rather insidious. It's much smaller. You don't think it's going to do any harm, but it can really transform sea, uh, food webs. And then would you believe our own European shore crab, a, a, a species which I love, um, everybody loves uh, on the, around the Isle of Wight. So if you go crabbing on holiday, that's the species that you'll find. It's a real nuisance globally. Um, because it um, is a, a predator uh, out of its um, comfort zone, I suppose, uh, in, in its non-native range. It doesn't have the predators itself. It doesn't have diseases. It's not ex exposed to parasites as it would be in Europe. And so these species really do get a foothold and uh, they burrow into the banks of estuaries and cause all sorts of erosion, all sorts of damage. But there are, of course, many others. And of course, a big challenge is, well, what can we do about them once they get into the sea? So what are the main, what we call pathways of introduction and dispersal for marine species? And of course, there's a lot of interest in this uh, locally uh, with uh, all the boating industry and interest in, in boating recreation. Well, firstly, these species can be transported around the globe at different stages in their life history. They can cling to the undersides of boats as what we call fouling, like uh, this yacht here being scrubbed on the hard at a boat yard. You can see all that uh, material dropping off there. And it it's, um, consists of native species, but there will be a lot of non-native species, almost certainly, on that yacht hull. So a lot of adults will be transported around as the boat moves around the globe, potentially. And then if you look at the top left, there's a ship there and it's releasing water. And this is ballast water. This is water that the ship will take on board uh, to uh, give it uh, extra stability. Perhaps it doesn't have much natural load. And so it takes on water so that it's stable in rough seas. And then when it reaches its port of destination, it will uh, then discharge that ballast water. And what might be in there? What might be in that ballast water? Well, perhaps larvae and spores of species which it took on board when it last left port and may have traveled hundreds, if not thousands of miles in the intervening period. Now, wildlife will get in all sorts of interesting places. And if you look at that lower diagram on the left there, you can see a diagram of ship and there's lots of different parts of a ship. There's the propeller, there's the engines, there's the cooling water systems, there's the hull itself, the bow thrusters, and all these places 
where um, water will pass through or is stored are potential habitat for species. And if you own a boat, you will only know that too well. They get everywhere. What about other pathways of introduction? Well, another important pathway is aquaculture. And uh, this is a, a really important um, pathway. Of course, organisms have been transported across the world for food for many, many centuries. The Romans used to transport native oysters across uh, the globe. Now, whereas we may be familiar with adult oysters and adult uh, mollusks being transported for food, it is also the juveniles which are sold to aquaculture businesses, which are then relayed in local areas to grow on for food. And contained within that seed, as we call it, these are juvenile oysters and clams, there might be spores of other um, organisms which are then transplanted, or they could be diseases of uh, the, um, the species which are then transported and then relocated uh, by us. Uh, a very early sign might be the growth of invasive species around aquaculture businesses and around the structures which they uh, will undoubtedly use such as the sea squirt didemonin vexillum, which is a really, really um, a bad thing to have around if you're a marina owner or you're working in aquaculture. And then what about other pathways? Well, in the news this week has been the Suez Canal. And the Suez Canal was constructed or completed in 1869 and was designed by a chap called Ferdinand Lesseps. And it really does, um, uh, connect the Red Sea with the Mediterranean. And uh, of course, it will come as no surprise to us now that species have moved from the Red Sea into the Mediterranean. And these are named Lesepsian species after the chap that designed and built the canal. And really, um, we now have about 500 species in the Eastern Mediterranean, an area known as the Levant Basin, which are of Indo-Pacific origin. And in, in such importance is this now that it's actually given its own biogeographical province, the Lesepsian province. Very few species have gone the other way from the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. They're known as anti-Lesepsians. There's a sun star. There's one or two other small things that are heading south, but most species are actually heading north. Now, a bit like what Keith said about Canada geese, are they good news or not? One can argue whether this has been really a good thing or not uh, in the Eastern Levant. Because uh, back in the 60s, the Aswan Dam was constructed. And prior to that, there was a very, very important um, sardine fishery in the Eastern Levant. But when the, sardine, when the uh, dam was constructed, the Nile then didn't uh, distribute all those wonderful nutrients and, and sediments into the Eastern Levant Basin. And the sardine fishery collapsed. But almost the salvation for the local fishermen has been the movement of species which have um, colonised the Eastern Levant and have become very, very important food sources. Um, that has not been, of course, uh, uh, always good because some of their native species, which they had used for food, have actually been um, outcompeted. But it's an interesting pathway. And um, I mentioned ballast water earlier on. Uh, well, the big container ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, the Ever Given, whilst it was stuck, of course, it had to lighten its load and it actually discharged 9,000 tonnes or cubic metres of ballast water into the Suez. Now that had um, come through the Pacific uh, from Malaysia. And so uh, one can expect some Malaysian species probably to start occupying the, the, uh, the canal basin and uh, into the Eastern Levant. So, so much for um, a global outlook. What about our local aliens, as they're sometimes called? Well, the Solent is a hotspot for alien marine biodiversity. Lots of going, lots going on, of course, ferry traffic, recreational sailing, boating, oil tankers, container ships, all coming into the Solent, having traveled. And in the ballast water, there'll be organisms. In, on the hulls, there'll be fouling. But what can we do about it? 
Um, one of those species has been around for a bit. This is the um, slipper limpet. And uh, it can be a real nuisance. If you do any survey work in the Solent on the seabed, you'll come across uh, lots of crepidula or slipper limpets. They have caused problems for oysters, native oysters. And in fact, there's um, because both are filter feeders, so they compete for food. In fact, bottom left there, uh, bottom right, I should say, there's a picture of a, a, a native oyster with a young crepidula or slipper limpet actually colonizing. In fact, you'll notice that there's a little one sitting on top of a, another a bigger crepidula. I could talk more about that, but that's another story. Now, barnacles, uh, what about barnacles? Well, yes, we have our own uh, invasive barnacle here, or I should say non-native, because we don't really know whether it's a nuisance or not ecologically. The jury's still out on this a bit, as um, some uh, researchers find some ecological impact, whereas others don't. And a lot of that depends on context and where you are in the world and what, how the organisms are responding. But this species was first recorded, um, as far as we know, in uh, Chichester Harbour, uh, shortly after World War II, and it's possibly as a result of Australasian shipping movements between the Solent and, uh, and the Southern Hemisphere, uh, military operations, of course, that enabled this species to become established. It was probably on the hulls of Australian battleships, uh, which were in port locally for a while, and it spread from there. And this uh, image here from a paper by Dennis Crisp in the 1950s shows the range expansion, um, uh, or should the non-native non range expansion from the mid 1940s to the mid 1950s. And of course, what this doesn't show is that it was expanding in the Eastern Channel as well. But now you notice it's, it's all over Europe, um, and uh, of course, in, still in its native range in Australia, as that bottom diagram shows, and New Zealand. But what a disjunct there between its native range in the southern hemisphere and non-native range in the north. If you uh, uh, are sailors and you hang around pontoons, you couldn't have failed to notice this one. It would sometimes colonise the underside of your hull, the sea squirt style of clava, or the Korean sea squirt, this was started, no, started noticing this after we started importing Japanese uh, cars in the 1950s. So it's probably hung on the hulls of Japanese car, uh, car transporters coming into the Solent, in the south coast of England, uh, recorded in Plymouth in 1953. But here's the question, how can we manage marine species? The sea is an open system. It doesn't have boundaries that are um, respected by living organisms. We can't easily contain species like this. So what on earth can we do? Well, uh, I'm sure you've um, been well used to looking at graphs over the past years. We've tra uh, tracked the pandemic and this one is not dissimilar to some of those we've seen. So this is the classic population growth curve. So when a species first arrives, it has a relatively low growth rate but then that quickly accelerates until it reach what's, reaches what it calls its carrying capacity, which is the limits, um, perhaps, uh, of growth to the resources that it has at its disposal, or it might be kept in check by predators um, or disease. And that's what we call the carrying capacity. And so this sigmoidal growth curve is, is very familiar to us. So what can we do when a species arrives? Well, as Helen says, one of the first things we must try and do is stop it arriving in the first place. So prevention is the first thing we must do right on the left there of our uh, graph there. If we're really lucky and we detect the species really early on, we might be, possi might be, might be possible to eradicate that species. But more often than not, we're looking at the bulk of that curve here um, where the species has actually established. It's gone beyond the point where we can easily eradicate it. So what approaches can we uh, have at our disposal? Well, we had a recent um, study by uh, in uh, last year published and really they, they were dismissive of, of um, some approaches like using bleach or biocides or encouraging diseases and parasites to um, take over. 
what they are suggesting is that we should encourage commercial use of those species once they become established. We should actually aid in marine habitat restoration, so we actually build up uh, native biodiversity to buffer the effects of any non-native uh, biodiversity that tries to um, establish itself. Physical removal is very important. Public awareness and education was most important of all those favoured approaches. So a couple of examples um, here. What about this one, the Pacific oyster, probably the most globalised non-native species uh, in the world. Uh, very tasty, if you like oysters. Um, and uh, they have been grown uh, in aquaculture for a good number of years. But more recently, we've been noticing that they have escaped, in inverted commas, beyond their aquaculture farms and started to settle in the wild, as that diagram on the, that picture on the top right shows. And uh, so you can see uh, they now are transforming some of our seashore habitats, muddy shore down in Brightling, so you see on the right there, or Rocky Reef um, uh, in Brittany and indeed a, a chalk reef in Kent on the left here. So here we have um, a, a great change in the food web that's appearing on the shores here. So what can we do about this? I mean, the, the species has a larval stage in the water, um, difficult to contain that, and of course it settles in thousands and millions. Well, there have been trials uh, in the last few years to try and eradicate these species using physical removal. And this means, means getting volunteers together and really getting the community on board to try and uh, keep these species in check and most importantly perhaps protect them from really sensitive, protect really sensitive sites like nature reserves or particularly rare species. Uh, dredging is also a possibility. We were involved in a pilot study to try and dredge a Pacific oyster reef to try and see whether that would work and actually keep um, important birds um, happy feeding um, locally in Bright Brightling Sea. Another example, the Manila clam, introduced for aquaculture in, to Pool Harbour in 1988. They thought they'd never breed, but now they've naturalised. They're all over the place in Pool Harbour, as that map, uh, distribution map on the bottom left shows. They were introduced just to the west of Brown Sea Island in aquaculture beds, but within just a few years, they've naturalised throughout the harbour. And they're now supporting a valuable fishery. Um, but what's interesting, of course, is that they have been introduced into one or two other areas under licence. Um, but nearby, other uh, populations have become established, which is rather strange because we know that it's difficult sometimes for some of these larvae to expand uh, the, uh, to get to places very quickly. So we suspect that there have been secondary introductions, perhaps by fishermen or other local clam enthusiasts, to try and establish uh, local populations because they're really, really tasty. Now, what problems does that cause? Well, what a uh, problem that uh, has recently been addressed in Pool Harbour, um, one problem was illegal fishing. And illegal fishing, um, uh, in areas where uh, there was a certain sensitivity for conservation, so bird feeding areas. And what happens when the fishermen uh, dredge these clams is they create these circles on the mudflats. Huge amount of disturbance to the mudflat and possibly the fauna which is used by, um, for birds for feeding. So there are uh, problems with illegal fishing, and disturbance to sensitive areas. So what can be done about this? Again, it's engaging with the stakeholders, engaging with the community, trying to get fishermen to understand the, the, the difficulties that um, um, birds face if they don't have enough food. Um, but here we, we've got a bit of a success story because um, the, the clam and cockle fishery in Pool Harbour worked in partnership with other stakeholders, with conservation bodies, to try and reduce illegal fishing and uh, in the process actually uh, agree to uh, a management plan where certain areas of the harbour were closed for certain times of the year and other areas 
permanently closed. So um, as a result of the survey work and the engagement that was uh, undertaken across the range of partners, we've got a bit of a solution, which is at least keeping the, the clam in check. It's not increasing at the moment that we know of massively, um, but it's also allowing people to earn a living from it. And it's allowing this population to actually um, be sold at a premium price. So getting uh, people on board. Now, another thing that um, we need to be aware of, of course, is the rise in artificial structures. And many of these species are opportunists. So whether these structures are uh, wind farms or whether they are uh, new sea defences, non-native species will make a beeline for those structures. Um, they like boring surfaces generally speaking, and they can achieve very large populations on those surfaces. This graph here shows basically lots of non-native species uh, growing on artificial structures, whereas native species primarily like um, uh, natural reefs. So artificial structures are a bit of an issue, but how do we manage artificial structures? How do we uh, enable native biodiversity to, um, to grow on those structures and yet discourage non-native potentially harmless, harmful um, invasives. Well, one way, of course, we can do that is by mimicking natural habitats within a new design. So here we have a, uh, a project I'm involved with. Uh, this is um, looking at artificial reefs and artificial structures which have been 3D printed. And with 3D printing of concrete, you can actually create some quite lifelike features, which encourages native biodiversity to the extent that it doesn't give non-native biodiversity the same foothold and opportunity. Now, of course, we've been talking about management. What, what about celebrating? Uh, doing nothing, celebrating non-native biodiversity, you know, a bit like the Canada goose, you know, should we just accept it for what it is? Um, and uh, we have on the Isle of Wight this wonderful sea anemone, which I'm really passionate about, the starlet sea anemone, called Nematostella vectensis, and it's, it's a, a species which was first recorded globally here on the Isle of Wight in the 1930s. And it's called Vectensis in the specific name after the Roman name for the Isle of Wight, Vectis. And uh, always a bit of a, a strange thing, the, this anemone, because uh, we knew that uh, it was found in British Columbia in Canada, and we knew that it was found on the Isle of Wight and in other brackish lagoons in southeast England. And so there was a bit of a question mark as to really whether it was native or non-native. And the recent results are that it's almost certainly a non-native species here on the Isle of Wight and in Britain. Its native range is in uh, the Pacific coast of North America, and it's almost certainly arrived as a result of oyster transportation. But it's protected, it's protected under European law, not that that applies to us anymore, but it's also protected uh, or given status um, by the IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, as a red listed species. And we use it as a flagship for saline lagoon conservation here in the UK. So maybe here we've got another management approach. We celebrate our non-native species. Now, finally, ones to watch. And uh, this is something for the citizen scientists and the surveyors and the recorders. And as marine recorder for the Isle of Wight Natural History Society, I'll be very keen to receive records of these. And uh, we have two mollusks here, the veined wrapper whelk, which is quite a large thing. And uh, there's a fishery for this. And one way, of course, we can keep these things in check is to fish them out. But I'd be very interested to hear of any records of this, any fishermen watching, um, let me know if you hear these. And then the Asian date nut mussel. Um, there's a project going on, there's a PhD student, Kate Day from Portsmouth University, would love to hear of any records of Asian date mussel. She's doing some studies locally in Southampton water where she has found some. Um, and uh, uh, so please get in touch with Kate if uh, you're interested in getting involved with that survey. So big thank you for joining this evening, big thank you to the society and um, uh, let's continue the celebration. I'm going to flip over to Helen 
Helen, we had a question from Tom Gray saying, should we actually sing each species on a species by species basis um, as with regards to the damage it causes? And probably Tom's hitting on the distinction between invasive species and non-invasive native species. Um, I don't know what your feelings are with regards to that. Yeah, I think absolutely it's really important to think on a case by case basis. And um, as I mentioned, across um, the UK, we have about 2,000 established non native species, and only about 15% of those are causing any kind of problems. But those that are are causing really quite um, dramatic problems. And as I showed you from the um, Guardian today, that we can see that those, um, the costs of the damage that they're causing are going up going up year on year. But I think it was also um, really wonderful to hear the other talks and the point that context is all important and where these species are, it can vary the way in which we perceive the impacts that they're having. So most definitely that it's really important. And I also noticed in Tom's question that he talks about species that may be in some way or other providing or acting as ecological replacements for other species that maybe are declining. And there is a lot of um, discussion and a lot of thought around a novel ecosystem, so to speak, um, or adaptation to some of these species and making use of some of these species. And for example, in Africa, Africa, we see where water hyacinths have caused really huge problems, but now people are beginning to use those in an industry around water hyacinth. I think my concern at times is that we don't fully understand the ecological complexity of these systems. So when people are talking about novel ecosystems, our understanding of the nuances of the different interactions that those species might have is just not good enough at the moment for us really to be able to say with um, confidence that one species can replace another. And indeed, I think all of the ecological thinking points to that if we move to, as so to speak, biotic homogenization, where we pretty much have the same species everywhere carrying out um, the similar functions, we won't have such resilient systems. More chat rather than questions regarding Canada geese on the Isle of Wight. Um, I don't know, are they being controlled at the moment? And what is your opinion about whether people, whether you can encourage people not to feed them and how we actually handle public engagement with species that are possibly um, doing harm to the environment? Yeah, there's no, um, there's seem to be no uh, requirement for control on the island. Um, unlike uh, some of the other places, urban areas um, in, in mainland uh, Britain, um, notably London. But um, of course, the, the Canada goose um, uh, is protected by the, um, the, the 1981 Wildlife Act. And uh, uh, in the closed season, you, you, you can't um, damage either the bird or the uh, or its nest or its eggs, um, but there is a um, there is a license which is given by Defra, um, where you can uh, you can kill or take eggs from a nest um, if there's certain things you need to preserve, such as public health and safety, or uh, conserve flora and fauna and pre pre prevent spread of disease or prevent damage to the farmland. So you can actually get a license. To, do, to kill or take eggs um, uh, in, in very specific cases. Um, uh, but um, no, there isn't uh, any, any, we don't see there be any need for control on the island um, at the moment. However, um, we're probably very fortunate that on the island, there's very, very few places where uh, the public come in contact with the geese. And I think I think Ride Canoe Lake um, is is probably and maybe the only place where you get uh, the two coming together. And um, what what the, whoever's asked asked the question, um, the, there's a, a an excellent um, management plan by the uh, the Wandle Valley, which is sort of Bath, Battersea and Wandsworth area. And they, they've got a management plan for um, keeping geese 
uh, apart from the public. But they've also got a, uh, and I think this is, this is crucial, and perhaps this is where we perhaps need to start in a place like Ride Canoe Lake, is, is somehow engage with the public, explain to them um, why it's not a good idea um, to get close uh, and, and feed, feed, feed the geese and the problems which they, uh, they might have. So, um, I mean, obviously a simple and low cost start is to have posters, signage, um, uh, sort of posts on social media um, to, to sort of uh, make people aware and educate people. Um, but fortunately that really is on a very small scale. We don't have to uh, do a lot. We can just focus in on Ride Canoe Lake. And um, uh, I think uh, we, we can perhaps begin to solve a problem quite quickly. But on a big scale where, they're, where they've got um, you know, real problems of, of people, the public uh, in London coming across Canada geese, um, there are uh, sort of more expensive management uh, uh, options which they can take which will um, try to sort of fence off areas of, of, of water body and they can try and uh, build up vegetation along the side of the river to, to, uh, to, to, to control and perhaps uh, dissuade the geese from getting into the water. And of course, geese don't like being enclosed. So um, if you can, um, because you know, they feel vulnerable to predation. So if, if, if there is a real hotspot problem area to, to create bit more of an enclosure will dissuade the geese. Roger, two questions for you. I'd be grateful if you could answer both of those. Can, can you see them there? Uh, one is with regard to your favourite marine species. And, oh gosh, there's a third one coming now. Uh, the other one was with regard to mid-ocean mid transfer palace. Right. Well, perhaps if I address the uh, ballast water question first, because it's probably the easiest. Um, well, the, the, the good news about the ballast water is that there's been a relatively recent tightening of the legislation. Um, so ships um, are now required to undertake quite detailed sampling of their ballast water uh, and record the, um, the contents and so on, and, and almost um, a bacterial and uh, obviously bigger stuff uh, analysis, you know, on a regular basis. So there has been some um, new news there. So it all has to be sampled, um, just like drinking water is rarely, um, although I wouldn't want to drink ballast water, um, but looking at the, the life that's in it. And again, it's all about trying to prevent um, uh, new new uh, establishment arrivals and establishment and um, when taking on ballast and then releasing it it, it should really be um, more than 200 nautical miles from the shore and preferably in sea 200 meters deep uh, so there should be um, and that's of course to to lessen the likelihood that those larvae or spores would would reach uh, coastal regions again. Um, interestingly, you know, a lot of these non-native species and invasive species are tend, tend to be coastal. So the larvae are picked up um, from the, the port of origin or close to the port of origin and then discharged um, ideally at sea um, away from the coast so that uh, there's to reduce the likelihood of re-establishment. So yeah, there's some good news there and we'll just see whether this new management um, is successful and, and, and is effective. Um, I just noticed, I think that Kate Day from Portsmouth University has put some uh, information in the chat if you want to uh, uh, find out more about her, her project. Um, as far as my the favourite marine species is concerned, well, what a lot to choose from, really. Um, there's so many different species i've got to say sharks because i mean obviously that everybody loves sharks um and um and but there's so many other different fish one species which i used to really enjoy telling people about when i used to lead field parties well, i still lead field parties on the shore was a tiny little sea slug called elysia viridis and elysia is an amazing thing because it munches away at the seaweed uh, called codium and uh, unlike most 
animals, which will then just obviously excrete everything pretty much. It doesn't, it actually keeps the chloroplasts of the plant cells within itself. And then it opens up two flaps like that on its back. And it, 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 it actually exposes these chloroplasts, which absorb the sunlight energy. Uh, it's like a real plant and it produces sugars. And isn't that just fantastic? That is um, the original solar organism, really, isn't it? And um, so that's always fascinated me and, uh, and how it uh, goes about its life and, uh, and uh, absorb, you know, being a, is it a plant or is it an animal? Well, it's most definitely an animal, but it's using plant cell organelles really to, to um, uh, get, its, get its sugars. So let's go for tonight, at least. Let's go for Elysia viridis. Brilliant, thank you, Roger. Right, um, one more question, or perhaps one, two questions. I'd like to say to the three of you, um, you can all answer, or perhaps just a couple of people, whatever you think. Um, going back to Hen's talk at first about how special islands are, um, I'm often concerned well, because we have a, certainly a lot less species on the Isle of Wight um, than are often on the mainland. Um, deer being one of them that's often very controversial. Should we have deer on the island? Um, would they destroy the unique habitat we have in our woodlands? I'm not going to ask you about deer. White clawed crayfish often comes up and whether the Isle of Wight should be used as an arc site because we've not got any of the American crayfish. I'm always very hesitant about re or it might be reintroducing or introducing something that isn't here already. Um, don't necessarily want you to talk about crayfish, but I'd like you to talk about the whole theory of using an island as an arc site uh, for a reintroduction of a species. Well, we already are really. We are accommodating this experiment with a white-tailed eagle. And I guess if we took a straw poll now of people who would be in favour and who would be against, we would probably find possibly more in favour, but there would also be quite a lot against. And um, I think it goes back to what control measures and what, what, the, what are the real objectives here? Um, and could there really be any benefits for establishing white-tailed eagles? And, of course, we have lost a lot of predators. Uh, I think in the oceans, of course, we, we're harvesting predators. And what impact is that having? Well, it's encouraging predator food to grow. So we have abnormally large populations of, of um, herbivores out there at the moment. And, um, and just by, uh, if, if we didn't fish, take, our, take the carnivores as much, then we would be, um, perhaps um, readdressing that balance a bit. And this is why, of course, shark conservation and big predator conservation generally is, is so important because we do need those top predators. We do need that top-down control on, on the food web. So there's got to be good ecological reasons. Um, in the sea, I'd be always, I'll be very nervous because or in any aquatic system, because you don't know what else you're taking in, you're bringing in. And, um, you know, diseases and viruses are very small. Um, and how can you be absolutely sure that your invertebrates, your crayfish or whatever, are actually totally disease free? So I'd be very nervous about introducing any aquatic species into the system as a, uh, uh, as a even for an arc site, personally. Yeah, I think I would just add to that, that um, as we've mentioned with some of the other species, it's very much sort of case by case and depending on the actual context as well. And you know, I think some of the, the ways in which now we can go about risk assessments to really evaluate the evidence around the impacts that a species might have if we were to follow a reintroduction program or indeed thinking about um, arc species. Um, I think it's really important that we go through those thorough processes of risk assessment. And of course, still things can go awry, but um, we do have those tools to do those um, 
really thorough assessments. So thank you everyone for coming along and special thanks to the three speakers. Um, I need to remind you that there are two more webinars uh, in the next week on Monday and Wednesday, and also to have a look at the Natural History Society website uh, for details about membership and for details about iWatch and everything else.